Welcome to the 16th year of the seminars at Steamboat. 16, that's, that's good. I'm Bob Stein, seminars chair. It is great to see so many of you here. How many of you are here for the first time? Could you raise your hand? You've all been here before. Well, there's some. Thank you and welcome. A special welcome to you all. We have five timely and important seminars this summer as we continue to provide nonpartisan looks at some of the public policy issues that are on everybody's mind. Listening, discussing, and participating is especially important as policy positions in our country continue to become more polarized. We hope that the discussion of these issues will start, but not end, at the seminars, and will continue with spirited and courteous discussion after the seminars have concluded. The next four seminars are indicated on your programs. Next Monday on Korea, uh, the week after that on cyber warfare, then a look at self-driving vehicles, and finally, on uh, August 13th, a discussion of the future of the Democratic and Republican parties. A really good and timely season. We are trying a couple of new approaches this year to getting friends and everyone else into the pavilion more quickly, and I hope it worked. I would like to thank our sponsor for today's seminar, Dan Foley, of Sleeping Giant Financial Services, Dan. And our supporting sponsors, Carol and Russ Atha and Gay Roan. If you are a friend of the seminars, thank you for your support. If not yet, please consider becoming a friend. Support from friends enables us to bring to Steamboat outstanding speakers such as Stuart Butler, and also you are able to reserve tickets in advance and attend the very popular Dutch Tree dinners which take place after each seminar at the Grand. This dinner is closed, but others still have room, and I would also like to thank our continuing partnership with KUNC, which again will broadcast all of our seminars. This one will be on July 22nd at 8 p.m. As usual, please turn off your cell phones, recording devices, etc. Both the sound and light are distracting. Volunteers will be passing out cards for your questions, so get them in as soon as you can and write as legibly as you are able. Our introducer today, Bell Sawhill, is a founder of the seminars, also a colleague of Stewart's at the Brookings Institution. And Bell, could you please come up and introduce him? Well, let me just add uh, to what Bob said, that it is fabulous to see so many of you here. It's just very, very gratifying, I think, to all of us who are on the board and work through the year to make this happen, so thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Stuart Butler. Uh, he's my colleague now because he is at the Brookings Institution. But as you will note, if you read his bio in your program, he spent 35 years at the Heritage Foundation in Washington. And uh, for those of you who don't know, it is arguably the most conservative think tank, certainly in Washington and possibly in the country. <laughs> but I want you to know that, you know, even though Stuart has, and he was, had leaders, several leadership positions there, but I want you to know that um, just as you know, you can't always tell a, a zebra by its stripes, you can't always predict where someone's going to come out just because of their uh, long-term affiliations. And I uh, do want you to know that uh, Stuart is um, 
someone with very unusual uh, character behind those stripes. And I think what I like about him in particular is, first of all, he's an expert. He cares about the facts. He knows health care policy. And uh, that's very important, <laughs> uh, obviously. Uh, you may not know that he created the health care model that became the health care system in the state of Massachusetts when Mitt Romney was governor. And we often refer to that in the health care world as Romney care. And Romney care, in turn, was a model for Obamacare. Uh, there's some differences, but really that's a little bit of the intellectual history here. And right at the very beginning of it is Stuart uh, Butler. So he really knows his stuff. Secondly, what I like about him is he's, uh, he ha he's open-minded. He has what he calls, and what I would agree, excellent table manners. <laughs> and uh, we were uh, talking about this this morning, and uh, I, th I think you will find that even if you disagree with him, I often do disagree with him myself, he disagrees with you in the gentlest of tones. <laughs> And thirdly, he has been a leader in trying to find uh, common ground, not only on health care, but on other issues as well, such as fiscal policy and the enormous debt facing uh, the country. And he's both passionate and optimistic about the ability of bringing people together, getting them in dialogue with each other, and trying to find some common understanding. And I think we could all agree that right now we need that more than ever. So it's with great pleasure that I ask you to join me in welcoming Stuart and also his lovely, wonderful wife, Jamie, uh, to Steamboat Springs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Belle. Uh, of course, Belle has let the cat out of the bag uh, in terms of my background. Um, I'm not sure my friends at the uh, Heritage Foundation will be too enamored uh, to, to be told that I was the inventor of uh, Romney Care and some aspects of Obamacare, but still I have to live with that, I suppose. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I noticed, by the way, I noticed that, by the way, that uh, when uh, Bell talked about the importance of facts. There, there was one person, at least, uh, that applauded. So maybe that says something about. Uh, oh, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is actually uh, the first time I've been to Steamboat Springs. I have to confess, uh, my wife and I. We've been here for a couple of days. Uh, we spent the last couple of days with Bell um, uh, hiking. Uh, around, so we've been we've seen a lot of very nice views and some heights. And I must say, I want to thank Bell for arranging for Sherpa guides to bring up uh, canisters of oxygen and uh, <laughs> and iced lattes that made the whole experience really very pleasant. Uh, as Bell said, what what I've tried to do a lot through my career is to try to figure out ways in which conservatives like me uh, and liberals can find ways uh, of moving forward together and to find ways of uh, solving problems and uh, moving the country forward in various ways uh, by actually looking at what they have in common rather than what they have that, that separate them. I have to say that uh, in Washington these days, trying to find bipartisanship and moving forward is not an easy thing to do. So I hope you're really sympathetic for me uh, in this. And uh, indeed, those of us who try to do that, try to move forward sort of bipartisanship in this particular environment, uh, we measure success a little differently than other people do. Uh, in fact, I, I, I tend to think of, uh, of defining success in the area of trying to build these bridges, a little bit like uh, Churchill uh, uh, defined success. Uh, Churchill said, success is the ability to move from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Uh, so today I'm trying to get you to be enthusiastic, not to go from failure to failure, but to, to recognize that when we think about healthcare and the future of healthcare, there is some reason to believe, uh, some reason to have some optimism uh, in this area. And that's really what I want to focus on. I'm, I'm sure during the Q&A, we can talk a lot about some specific uh, questions you have. But I want to make the case and sort of try to give some argument as to why we might be optimistic about finding a bipartisan way forward uh, on healthcare. 
Now, of course, the first thing you've got to do if you're going to get any kind of agreement is actually sit down and talk to each other. I know this is a peculiar idea uh, these days, but actually sitting down and having a conversation and, and talking about each other's backgrounds and uh, uh, their views and concerns and worries is a necessary condition for having any conversation. And I want you to know that despite what you see on television and probably in the papers and so on, actually a large number of people are and have been for many months and will be in the future getting together in Washington and other places from the left and the right and the middle to actually try to find ways forward. This has been going on and it's a very, very important uh, piece of the equation in terms of, of, of reaching some kind of bipartisan agreement. Uh, last year, uh, I was involved with uh, an effort like this run by an organization called Convergence. Convergence brings together people from very different backgrounds and perspectives, brings them into the same room over a long period, sometimes a year to 18 months, but, but a long period coming regularly. And we have at Convergence um, professional mediators and facilitators who actually use the techniques of mediation to get like Republicans and Democrats to talk to each other and try to find agreement. Uh, one of the mediators we used uh, last year in this uh, regard was somebody whose background uh, involved uh, negotiating agreements between Palestinians and Israelis. We thought this would be a particularly valuable background uh, for somebody to, to get Republicans and Democrats uh, together. Uh, sometimes I talk about this process as uh, family counseling for policymakers. Uh, because actually it uses the techniques of getting people to really put on the table their, their concerns, their worries, their anger, and so on, in order to find ways to get agreement. Well, last year we had uh, such a group uh, which, which comprised uh, people like the former senior advisor, health advisor for, uh, for the late uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, the senior, former senior advisor in the, for uh, Mr. Romney in the Romney um, uh, Ryan uh, campaign in 2012, uh, former health administrators from uh, the Bush administration, uh, the Obama administration, and others, all in the same room, actually trying to come together uh, on agreement on these, on these issues. And surprisingly, we were pretty successful. What actually started to happen is that those of us, including myself on the more conservative side, began to say, look, we will be willing to uh, put on hold what we really want in the future, a more market-based system, and go with the basic structure of the Affordable Care Act, which of course Bell has told you I wrote, but anyway, uh, uh, with the basic structure of the Affordable uh, Care Act. Meanwhile, on the left, uh, we had our friends on the left essentially saying, look, I'm willing to give up uh, my heart's desire of a single-payer system or Medicare for all and so on in order to use the Affordable Care Act as a vehicle for moving in the direction that they want. And we got agreement on a number of issues, including the fact that everybody in America uh, should be able to get an adequate, to be able to afford and get access to an adequate level of health care. People on both sides agreed that. Uh, now, admittedly, how you get there and what's adequate is open to some conversation. But that's a, it's an important start to say, we do have a common goal. Uh, we also got people to agree that there could be variation across the country. Uh, it may not look the same everywhere. And we got agreement on uh, the fact that uh, we need to look at the subsidy system, whether it be tax credits or subsidies or Medicare. And that needs to be redesigned so that it truly is uh, available and adequate for everybody. There was a lot of agreement uh, on this. And actually, uh, the press drew attention to this. Let me see if I can actually get this to work here. Oh, I'm going to need some technical help. Oh, here we go. Hold on, let me go back. Let me go back. Whoops. So don't even look at that one just yet. That's a nasty one. I don't want you to look at that. But this just, is, it just gives you some sense of the kind of um, reaction that there's been to people coming together in this way. So it, what we're now doing in this particular uh, process, and others are doing something similar, is to widen the number of people, to get more people and more organizations together to start exploring this and to see what they, what they can achieve. So that is what's going on. So people are talking to each other. That's really the key point I want to get uh, across at this point. Uh, and, and therefore, we should be very 
uh, happy that that's actually happening despite what you see generally in this country. But also, I want to, what I want to lay out to you today is that, in all, that, that there are certain underlying trends and patterns about the US healthcare system and the way it operates now that actually help us and will help us in the future to get to a bipartisan agreement on healthcare. Uh, I truly believe that's, that's the case. So even though there is a lot of disagreement, even though there is gridlock, uh, certainly at the national level uh, right now in Washington, there are in fact underlying patterns of the US system that will help us moving this way. And I can say that with great authority, having come from another country. Uh, but I, 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 I studied American history and I studied the American system for many years in Britain before I came over here. So let me just start by uh, hoping this does work now. Oh, for some reason we are, for some reason something is slipping here. Here we go. Uh, it's a very sensitive uh, thing here. Uh, what I want to do this evening is really talk about three particular patterns that I think are really uh, very, very important. One is the federalism system in the United States, a core element of, of our country. Uh, I think that's a really important piece, which I'll explain in a second. Secondly, that we see now in this country, really belatedly, an, a, a, a greater understanding that there's much more to health than medical care. And that if we see health in a much wider way and moving to a health system that's much broader than strictly medical care, there's a lot of opportunity, in fact, to get agreement not just on substance, but to get people to be comfortable talking to each other and agreeing on how to move forward. And the third thing I want to touch on briefly at the end is that disruptive innovation, innovation in the healthcare system is kind of the wild card that a lot of things are happening and are likely to happen in the future that can change the whole terms of conversation very quickly. And that if that's the case, then you don't have to depend entirely upon uh, agreement on legislation, particularly national legislation. You can see things happening that will change the whole nature of the healthcare system in ways that allow us to find agreement and to move forward. So I want to touch really uh, on, uh, on each of these. Now again, let me see if I can do this without going, here we go, excellent. Uh, first of all, let me talk a little bit about the whole issue of federalism. As I said, I come from the, United, from the UK, um, I study American history, and the whole no notion and the nature of federalism in the United States is, is not unique to the United States, but is such a powerful dynamic uh, in this country. And there are very good reasons to believe why our federal system may be a very, a, an important key to how we can move forward on reaching agreement on, on health care. And there are, there are a number of reasons why uh, using federalism, particularly using the states, like Colorado and other states, as the primary engine of the health care system, as uh, we did in Massachusetts, as Bell said, in terms of trying to design a health care system, first of all, in Massachusetts before at the national level, but allowing the states to move forward and be the drivers of change in the health system, in my view, makes a lot more sense than trying to focus entirely on trying to do this nationally. And there are several reasons. One is, believe it or not, in Washington, we don't know all the answers. Uh, there are a lot of ways in which healthcare functions, insurance functions, and so on, where you can get people looking at, quote, the facts, and yet disagree on what those facts really are telling you about how to think, how the best way to design something. So with with federalism, with allowing states to experiment with different variants of, of healthcare, we have an opportunity to see what works and doesn't work. So instead of having an argument where it's sort of, you know, my research and my computers versus your research and your computers, you can actually look at what happens in particular states and allow things to be tried out in the state and actually see on the ground. So federalism gives us an enormous opportunity to cut through argument and actually see what the facts show on the ground of particular approaches. Like that's really important. Then let me, let me skip to the bottom one, uh, the bottom point I make here, uh, first, first of all, that federalism can also allow you to combine a broad agreement on goals with doing things differently in different places. So you can have an agreement on what your objectives, what your goals are, but allow variations and as you can see, since uh, I work at the Heritage Foundation for many years, I quote Deng Xiaoping of Communist China, uh, pointing out 
Uh, I don't do this terribly often, I have to say, and if any of you uh, uh, are contributors to the Heritage Foundation, I apologize. But anyway, uh, he used a term in the 1990s, uh, one country, two systems. He was talking about Hong Kong. And now, in a sense, we have uh, sort of one system, uh, one country, and 50 or 51 systems, or whatever you want to call it, uh, in this country. So we can have, you can have a situation where you can have a broad agreement on a goal and yet have different methods of reaching it. I think that's a powerful factor in the US system that will allow us to move forward. We don't have to have complete agreement on exactly how to do things in one place rather than another. Of course, the, uh, those of you, I'm sure there might be one or two of you who support the Canadian system, uh, uh, must also recognize that in the Canadian system, you really have 10 provinces. Uh, there's a lot of similarity uh, between the health system in each of those. But it's not a unified system uh, uh, specifically. It's not a completely unified system. Now, I apologize for if any of you are Canadians of lumping together Canada and communist China, uh, but you'll forgive me for that, uh, I'm sure. But the other thing I want to mention in the middle is of another aspect of this. And that is, in my view, the American federal system and the ability of and, and allowing states this, these uh, abilities to move forward and to try different things is a crucial element in building a consensus over time. One aspect of, of federalism, as I said, is that you can have different approaches to fulfill the same objective in different states. But one of the things, one of the patterns we see in federalism is that by doing that, what tends to happen over time is it is almost a trial and error process that gradually you see consensus building to go in a certain direction. It doesn't always happen, but it happens in, a lots, of, in, in lots of areas. It happened, for example, in the, those of you who remember the welfare reform of the mid-90s under, under President Clinton. There were a lot of activities at the state level trying out different th various things that a lot of liberals didn't like, or, or thought would lead to a very bad end. Sometimes a lot of conservatives thought it would lead to, a bad end, lead to a bad end. But the very fact that a number of states started to coalesce around an approach of a limited welfare system, a work requirement, and so forth, actually built up a national consensus. Think also about uh, the remarkable uh, change in this country with regarding to gay marriage. Gay marriage did not take place in this country because uh, of, a, of, of a, uh, a Supreme Court decision. That was really the final step. The, all the other steps were a gradual introduction in different ways around the country and gradually a consensus bit. So one of the things I really want to emphasize about the nature of federalism with regard to bipartisanship is that it is a way through this process of trying different things and having variations. It is a way of building consensus over time. And I strongly believe that in the healthcare area, as, and I'll say a little bit more about this, as we allow states to experiment and to try things, over time we will build a much stronger consensus and a bipartisan consensus about, being, about big change in the health system than we are ever likely to do in the foreseeable future by focusing on national legislation first. That, I think, is that's absolutely what I want to kind of emphasize with regard to federalism. And then let me just, um, talking about federalism, to just say a little bit further, again, I'm a little sticky here, but here we go, that within the United States, we have, uh, many of you may not know this, but let me just fill you in a little bit more, uh, within our healthcare system, we have um, a number of very important instruments to allow states uh, to experiment in this way, particularly in the Medicaid program, which serves primarily, as you know, uh, low-income uh, uh, people, uh, the federal government can uh, allow states, and does allow states, and has done for many years, to make changes in the basic Medicaid system. Uh, along the lines I said earlier, to say, you've got as a state to keep to the basic objectives of Medicaid, and, and so on, but you can, with permission, with the agreement of the federal government, make variations in it uh, in order to achieve that objective. And we've used that power very extensively in the, in the Medicaid program over many years. It's led to, an, uh, it led to a lot of new people being able to obtain Medicaid, changes in the way it was delivered, very important innovations in that area. So we have an instrument 
in, in, in Medicaid, it's called the 1115 waiver process, to allow states to move forward in that area. An interesting other uh, ability we have is as a result of the Affordable Care Act, Obama, Obamacare. That legislation includes a specific provision called Section 1332, uh, which allows states to come to the federal government and say, yeah, we kind of like the objectives of, of the Affordable Care Act, but we'd like to do this quite differently. This waiver authority in the, in the Affordable Care Act actually gives remarkably wide opportunities for states to reach those objectives differently, whether it be a liberal state or uh, a conservative state. In fact, one of the reasons that piece of legislation, that provision is in there, is because uh, one state, Vermont, thought maybe we can use this to get to a single payer system. Well, they kind of didn't quite get there, but still. Uh, but because what it does is allow states to make fundamental changes in the subsidy system, in, to some extent, the benefits uh, in the Affordable Care Act, to the way in which uh, benefits are delivered, and so on, to alter that, and to come to the federal government uh, in this way. So we actually have some very important tools in current law, whether it's dealing with low-income people, uh, or with people under the Affordable Care Act to actually have these kinds of variations that I've referred to. That's legislation. We don't have to invent that. It's there. So we have a tool uh, uh, that's, that's absolutely there. And, but when we think about this, and I just want to be um, quite open about this, when we think about federalism, I know lots of people get nervous about um, just simply allowing states to move forward uh, when they are concerned about what states will do and what some of the issues are associated with it. So I just listed some of the questions we still have to think about. And when we get together, whether it be in the group that I talked about uh, or other groups, there are a lot of issues with allowing states to experiment, to do things a little differently, to go in a slightly different direction, and so on. And I listed some of them. One is uh, what I often hear, either some variant of, uh-oh, what would Alabama do? Uh, is there anybody from Alabama? I didn't want to be insulting or anything like that, but okay, it seems like I'm okay. Because, oh, I'm sorry, I'm totally sorry. You must be the person who applauded about facts, I think, right? Okay. But the, the generic point here is if you give states considerable flexibility, will some of them simply shortchange people with regard to, well, to regard to healthcare and actually do the minimum or nothing? So one of the questions you've got to, you've got to have is, how much leeway do you give a state to experiment, say, in the healthcare area? Do you just give them all the money that you gave them before and say, just do it, do whatever you want? Most people are very nervous about that. And so in section 1332, and in general in this conversation, we come up with the idea of there should be some, the term that's often used is guardrails. You give states flexibility and allow, or allow them to come to the federal government and, and ask for flexibility. But there are certain boundaries that you put in place. And the legislation in the case of the uh, Affordable Care Act does that in terms of not allowing uh, or requiring states to make sure that people don't end up spending more as a result of the state doing things differently, that people are not dropped, uh, at least uh, as in, in broad terms, are not dropped, that there's only certain variations and so on. So one of the things you have to do when, if you're thinking about a federalism strategy like this to build the momentum for bipartisanship is to think through what are the guardrails that you require. There's a lot of the debate going on right now in these, these conversations that I mentioned is over things like this. Are the current guardrails too rigid? Does it not allow enough flexibility? Uh, are, they, are the requirements too high and just make the whole thing too expensive for any state that's trying to to do things differently. That's the kind of thing that the conversations are about. These are good conversations because they really do rely on expert opinion, on experience, on what the research shows, uh, and, and so forth. So it's really important to kind of think about that. Uh, another thing it's really important to think about is who gets to decide what a state can do? Because clearly, if it's the federal government and if it's the administration, and they can say yes or no to a state, then that's the number of things a state in practice can experiment with is going to depend upon what the administration in power believes. And you see that right now. 
uh, the Trump administration has a lot of things it's interested in seeing states explore. In particular, uh, one is the idea of so-called high-risk pools. I don't want to go in. I can answer if you want to hear a lot more detail about this. But basically what high-risk pools, the idea of high-risk pools, is to say rather than having all the costs of really expensive, you know, very sick or people with chronic illness, all sort of subsumed in the cost of insurance for everybody, let's take the really costly people out of that equation. So therefore, the costs of covering other people declines and premiums go down. Let's put these people in a high risk pool and let's subsidize that directly. And the state of Alaska and several other states have come forward with proposals to do that. And that's because the administration sent a letter very early on saying, if you want to set up a high risk pool in your state, we're open for business. Uh, but if you want to, for example, if you want to set up a single payer, I don't think I would bother putting a, spending money for a stamp to send that to the Trump administration. If, I were you. So if, if you are thinking about this, as I know you are here in, in Colorado, I wouldn't uh, do that. Uh, so one of the things to think about is, are there ways of making this reliance on states as the primary engine and trying to, is there some way of making that less dependent upon the particular uh, administration in power? Well, to some extent, it solves itself over time because we are actually in a period here in the United States of over the long haul, we do see a lot more change of power in the Congress and in the administrations over time than we have in a lot of previous periods. So one way or the other, you may have a lot of particular things going into place in, uh, now under this administration. In the future, uh, another administration may favor another approach. So over time, you may, even with even the current arrangement, you might have a lot of variation over time. But other people, including myself, uh, as Bell said, I've, I work with a number of people at Brookings myself, and, and another researcher, a health researcher called Henry Aaron, who literally sits in, sits in the next office to me. Henry is so liberal, he's off the boundary over here. Right? We can't even agree on what time of day it is we disagree. But we agreed that if you wanted to see what he thought were really good state experiments moving forward, and what I thought, we should have some more, more um, we should have a group deciding on what states can do, which is not just the administration. And we argued for a commission, a model that would have different, maybe comprised of the leaders of certain states and some people from the administration and some others to sort of say yes or no to particular variations. But so, so that was an attempt to try to deal with this issue of if you're going to get state uh, experimentation this way, how can you make it as, um, uh, as neutral as possible, if you like, to get good ideas coming, coming forward. Uh, then the other thing, which is very much an issue today, is to what extent, if a state wanted to do healthcare a little differently, how much should you allow a state to add on a policy, what I call a policy right, or some policy in addition? That specifically is a hot issue right now, because some states want to add to the Medicaid program, uh, and the administration has encouraged this, some form of work requirement. And saying, not only is it a work requirement, but if you don't do that, you might lose Medicaid. Now, to a lot of people, that's a red line you should never cross to withdraw that. But there's a lot of debate over this, about what kind of policy additions you should uh, be able to put onto uh, 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 a, a waiver of some kind. Uh, one state, Kansas, put forward a proposal to say, we will make Medicaid time limited. You can only have it for a certain time. The administration did not agree with that. Um, but that's an example of, of sort of more on the outlier of ideas that have been out there. So when we think of encouraging states, as, I, as, I've, as I've argued, there are still a number of issues that you have to sort of think through uh, and deal with. And um, it's, uh, it's, this, is, this is the heart of the conversation now uh, really going on. But my key point about thinking about federalism is that um, I believe, as I've said, that looking at a state-driven debate and a state-driven model and allowing states to experiment is, in fact, a way to build bipartisan agreement over time, that people, that that's a a very important, significant approach to dealing with this, rather than assuming that you have to do it at the national level. 
uh, it's, it's, it's crucial in that way. So that's one trend that I, I want to emphasize. The second one I want to emphasize uh, is uh, another pattern that's going on, which is that the idea that when we think about healthcare, uh, there's a lot more to healthcare than medical care. Uh, I think I know uh, here in Colorado, you know that very well. Uh, you go hiking and you go bicycling all the time. You're the healthiest state, uh, and so on. You know that exercise and so on is really uh, very, very important. Uh, but the idea that that uh, there's a lot more to healthcare than medical care is a very important concept because what it means is you start thinking about what are the contributors to health, what are the non-medical things that enable people uh, or uh, allow them and and cause them to be healthy uh, over time. And we know more and more about this. We know that uh, there are a number of factors which we now loosely call social determinants of health that explain why certain people uh, have a good health record over time and others that don't. For example, uh, we know that the, the uh, CDC uh, in, in Atlanta uh, explains that when you look at elderly people, uh, we have uh, a number of elderly people, of course, who fall. And many of them break uh, hips or bones and so forth. The CDC, uh, that's the Center for Disease Control, estimates that that costs the country about $50 billion a year, a good chunk of which is avoidable. Because, as I think we know, a lot of people fall when they're older, not because they've got some medical problem. It's because they trip over something. Their, their uh, carpets are not... Uh, uh, properly nailed down or, or attached, they slip, they fall down a step, and so forth, or they have an accident in their bathroom, they fall showering. If we were to invest some money in dealing with unsafe uh, bathrooms, for example, steps that are not sound, we could save an enormous amount of money in people who would not fall and would not be an enormous cost. So we know that safety and housing is very connected to what happens to a lot of people, particularly elderly people. We also know, going to the other end of the, of the uh, sort of age, that um, for young people, uh, stress and conditions in their home can be a very, very uh, powerful effect on their health uh, over time. We use this term in, in, in healthcare and in children's care, adverse childhood experience. That means something really bad, something stressful that happens to a child earlier on. We know many of these are linked over time to deterioration of health and poor, poor health care. Stress, uh, abuse, poor nutrition, a father who ends up in jail. If any of you are teachers uh, and you have encountered children whose parents, a parents has gone to jail, mental health issues, behavior, flow directly from that. We also know from a lot of this evidence, this research, that those effects can be long-lasting. That when a child is separated from their parent uh, who goes to jail, it can have long-term health effects. We also know that if some uh, child is separated from their parent at the Mexican border, it's likely to have very long and disastrous effects. We know this. We, all, we also know simple things, like if somebody can't easily get to the hospital or get to the doctor's office, I should say, because they may have to take three buses across town because they, they live with very poor transportation. That makes it less likely that they're going to uh, properly look after their health, fill prescriptions, and so on. We know lots of things like this that um, really contribute to ill health or good health over time. And increasingly here in the United States, as opposed to other countries, we are paying more and more at attention on this. Because quite frankly, if you look at us compared with other countries, which I'll show you in a second, uh, in the United States, we spend far too much on medical care and far too little on other things that contribute to good health uh, over time. <laughs> and, and, and let me just try to, let me just try to show you this quickly. This is a chart of the major industrialized countries. You may not be able to see it too well, but anyway. The top, the dark blue, is the proportion of the economy, so percent of GDP, so on spent on social services, social care. Not all related to things I've mentioned, but social care. And the bottom is the amount on 
uh, the proportion on healthcare. You see an interesting pattern. Uh, you see, if you look carefully, US in the middle, there's something different about our combination than these other countries. I mean, yeah, uh, first of all, we're in the, if you add it together, we're kind of in the middle, actually. Uh, but the amount we spend on health care compared with social care is completely an outlier compared with, with other countries. In fact, for the countries as a whole that I've shown you there, um, uh, as on, on average, these OECD countries, as they are, these large industrialized countries, um, spend about a dollar equivalent to a dollar seventy on social services for every dollar they spend on health care. In the United States, we spend 56 cents on social services compared with every dollar. An interesting thing is, if you look at the medical outcomes, the health outcomes of these countries, uh, they're either as good or better than the United States. Now, you have to put a few caveats in because the actual prices that we have in this country compared with other services is higher than these other countries. But that said, even building that in, and we have similar evidence to this when we look at across different states. If you look at, at how the combination of or the balance between social service spending in different states and medical spending, you see similar patterns. There are variations. And the ones that actually tend to spend proportionally more on the social services tend to have better health outcomes than those that spend predominantly on health care. You know, the issue is by the time you get to the hospital, a lot of the good work that should have been done, you know, has not been. So, yeah, we, we can fix you when you're broken. But better to have things taken care of earlier. So that's a, that's a very noticeable pattern in the United States. So let me just go back to, to the chart we had uh, uh, earlier. So we see this big, uh, this, this very significant difference. And the good news, again, is that there's more and more attention now being given to these non-medical factors in, in healthcare, the, the so-called social determinants. And the really good thing about that is that it isn't partisan in any way. Uh, I bring together at Brookings every month a whole group of people from different sectors who are focused in this uh, area, who uh, uh, are from housing and healthcare and so on. And we talk about this, about how to develop good healthcare uh, in this area. I have no idea of the politics of those people because we're talking about practical questions where people don't have to bring their ideology to the table. And there is a, bill, there is a, a growing consensus and a growing discussion about, about this. However, you know, there are things we need to do to build on this, to build both uh, an agreement in this country and to have a health system that focuses much more on social service factors and much less on medical fixing. We certainly need to do that. But there are things we need to do to move this forward in terms of policy. So the same people who are getting together, talking through about policy steps, are also looking at this kind of issue too. How do we get more uh, activity in this country to blend together social services and medical services in a way that makes uh, a lot more sense. And there are challenges. Um, we, uh, we, and, and, and some good progress. We're seeing in the Medicaid program, we have seen for many years, using the waivers that I mentioned, more and more movement towards looking at non-medical steps, like housing. We have a lot of waivers dealing with particularly elderly people on Medicaid, many of which are on Medicaid to look at how to improve the housing conditions they have to reduce costs and to improve their, their outcomes. We certainly see that. We do definitely need to have more of that approach in the Medicare program, dealing with the elderly in general, because Medicare does not have the same flexibility or hasn't had that we see in the Medicaid program for the poor at the state level. So I argue for beginning to build in more and more opportunities in Medicare for state variations, for states to, to have some opportunities in, uh, in that area. And that is beginning to happen. We're beginning to see more opportunities for variation in Medicare. The recent, um, one of the recent budget agreements included a provision that allows Medicare Advantage plans. Those are the private plans that about a third of the, just over a third of uh, Medicare recipients have. Allow those plans to build in a lot more attention to transportation, social services, and housing than had previously been the case. This is a, an important step in the right direction of beginning to get variation in that way. We also have to deal with something which I've referred to here as the wrong pocket problem. 
The wrong pocket problem means that sometimes if you're trying to get different service, if you're looking at non-medical services and, and enabling them to kind of work together and organizations to work together to improve healthcare by working together, one of the problems we have is often the budgets are siloed in such a way that individuals or organizations, agencies of government don't have a big incentive to look at ways of working across that lines to get um, collaboration and to move forward in, in healthcare. For example, let's say you were the housing authority in a, in a city, and so you, you're handling the housing budget, and somebody comes along and says, you know, it'd be a great idea if you were to go back into the elderly housing that you manage and fix up the bathrooms, change the steps, do all this kind of work, and you're running the housing budget. You have a tendency to say, well, wait a minute, I run housing. You want me to spend all this money. I'm not, a, I'm not uh, providing any more housing to anybody. And the people who are gaining from what, the other agencies that are gaining from this are Medicaid, Medicare, and so on. So the housing budget, its pocket, is carrying the cost, the benefits, the improvements, occur in somebody else's pocket. And we have a tendency, whether we're in the commercial sector or we're in the, the government sector, not to be real keen on having to spend money in our budget when the other guy gets all the benefit from it. So we have to look at ways of actually enabling much, a much broader view of budgets to occur. Fortunately, again, that's beginning to happen in, in some ways. Actually, here in Colorado, uh, we, we see a lot more cross-collaboration uh, in order to move forward and to improve people's lives here than is true in a lot of states. But you need to have uh, governors or county executives, mayors, actively getting their agencies to say, we don't just think of our budget, let's look at the whole picture and start to be more flexible. So increasing the flexibility, having leaders that see this is very important to, uh, to move forward. Then in addition, uh, we see the, the growth of lots of organizations now, and I've seen this very distinctly in the last several years, that have grown up in different uh, places that focus on how to get social services, housing, medical care, all working together that improves the health of the community and families and individuals. There are organizations that are focused on doing that. I'm the chairman of the board of a, of a system of clinics in uh, a community clinics in Washington called Mary's Center. This is a, a group of clinics that pr primarily focuses on immigrant Latin American families. Some are document, most are documented, some are not, and so on. But they're focusing on that community. And we're focusing on the health of that community. So we don't just provide medical care, we look at the factors that affect the health of, of those uh, individuals. And we're doing things like going into schools, we've developed partnerships with schools, 18 schools in the Washington metropolitan area, where we as a clinic provide additional services to those schools, particularly mental health, behavioral health services to children, and bring in their parents, and help teach, teach teachers about how to spot these concerns, when to call a doctor, and so on. None of that work that we do in the schools is funded by anybody. We have to raise money for that. So I'm saying that not because I would like you to by all means make a contribution, but I'm not saying it because of that reason. It's because we have a wrong pocket problem here. And, and there are organizations that are there that are trying to do this. We see schools moving more and more into this area of building, uh, particularly the, the community school uh, system, of building teams of people to focus in, in healthcare and to build services in that way. So there are these organizations that are developing. The interesting thing from thinking about bipartisanship is that people on the left and the right can look at these types of organizations in a different way. For somebody on the left, well, this is community organizing, isn't it? I mean, you just get, you're using community-based organizations to look at all the issues associated with somebody, to organize, to, and so forth. It's got absolutely perfect progressive pedigree. Now, a conservative like me comes along and says, this is de Tocqueville, this is, this is little platoons all over the country. This is non-government. This is organizations in the community. Left and the right can both agree and support this kind of development. So I say this because I think this is 
uh, it's particularly important to think about how this phenomenon of looking at social determinants of health, of breaking down these differences and, and being different sectors together, is in fact not only a way of improving good health care over the long term, but actually a way of getting people of a progressive background and a conservative background to work together and to agree on a step forward. And that's, that's the, the key thing I want to kind of emphasize with regard to that. Now, let me look very quickly at the last point I wanted to raise. Um, this idea of innovation. Um, like I said at the very beginning, innovation in healthcare is, in my view, a wild card that's not, that can change the environment for how we move forward and how we move forward in a bipartisan way quite dramatically. When we think of innovation in, in healthcare, we probably, most of us tend to think of medical innovations, of things that are done differently today. I mean, we now have, for example, uh, smart pills. Pills have little chips in them. And when you swallow them, uh, the acid in your stomach activates the chip, and a, a receptor can pick up when you took that, that, uh, that pill, and in some cases, how it affected some of your basic, you know, um, health, like blood pressure, um, temperature, and so forth. So it allows a lot of, of, of monitoring of particularly elderly people who are taking medication. Those are the kinds of innovations I think a lot of people think about. Another kind of innovation a lot of people think about is you know, an urgent care center, uh, as opposed to having to go to the, to the hospital. The, you know, we see a number of these kinds of innovations. I'm talking about a slightly different kind of innovation, which is innovations which dramatically change the nature of an industry. And we've seen that in lots of industries, and I've listed a couple of them here. Uh, Steve Jobs at Apple reinvented lots of things. He certainly reinvented computers, but he reinvented the music business. If you look at this, anybody who's uh, under 30 in the audience probably knows this very well, that the way you buy me uh, music and how music is marketed in this country is fundamentally different from what it used to be like. It's changed dramatically. Uh, Amazon um, used to be selling books. Now it sells everything. Uh, it's even, you know, uh, Mr. Trump is very annoyed at um, Amazon, as you probably know, because he thinks that, that, the, United, that uh, the U.S. Postal Service doesn't get enough money from Amazon, and he wants something done about that. Well, Amazon, you may have read recently, is now developing its own system of distribution and trucks using essentially the Uber model so that they don't care what the, you know, UPS is doing. Because they will completely do things differently. And so that's the kind of thing that's going on. I give you just one example uh, of, of some of the things that are really happening now, which you see maybe where recently. Again, it includes Amazon. Amazon has teamed up uh, with JP Morgan, the huge uh, financial company, and with uh, Berkshire Hathaway, or Warren Buffett, right? Uh, to start thinking about how to change healthcare. Um, a friend of mine, a, a very good and very experienced healthcare researcher, I won't name her, but it's not Belle, uh, I, uh, said to me the other, the, uh, a few days ago, well, you know, uh, they may be able to do something about their own internal costs, but they're not going to make any difference to the healthcare system as a whole. And I said, you know, there's a reason why Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett are billionaires, and we are not. <laughs> okay? They think differently. So I think it's important to kind of emphasize that these things, these are not partisan changes. This has nothing to do with ideology. This has to do with fundamentally, fundamentally changing the nature of the system. The more you do that, the less important legislation becomes. You don't have to solve every problem with a law if things are happening. And one of the key features of what we call uh, of, uh, uh, disruptive innovation is the tendency for this to be other industries entirely coming into the healthcare sector and fundamentally changing it because they have totally different skills, totally different views about how to organize something. That, to me, is a very high probability in the future. I don't know if it's this one. I don't know if it'll be something else. But I think I'm very confident it's going uh, to happen. So anyway, that I think those are three. I mentioned federalism and so on, and uh, what's going on in the 
uh, in the area of social determinants, what's happening in innovation. These are all things which, in my view, are going to make transformation of the healthcare system much more likely to occur in, a, in a, either a bipartisan or, or a nonpartisan way. So to sum it up, uh, I am actually quite optimistic about the future, about our ability to get through the current period uh, of a, at least seeming gridlock and inability to talk to each other. Because I think these patterns that I've mentioned are really very important. Number one, we actually have a lot more people willing to sit down and talk about this than you might imagine. It's, it's, there's a lot more conversations of those kind uh, going on. They're an important first step. Secondly, as I mentioned, our system of federalism allows us to have bottom-up change, and bottom-up change that can build consensus from the sort of the grassroots upwards, and by actually trying things in practice, rather than settling arguments that are ideological in nature and require legislation. I think federal and national legislation. I think federalism is really important. Thirdly, we're rethinking what healthcare is. And by understanding that there is a lot more to healthcare than medical care, and by having people from very different walks of life and different sectors increasingly working together, we are in fact transforming slowly, and I think it'll accelerate over time, what our healthcare system actually is. Again, in a bipartisan or nonpartisan way, and for the most part, without major pieces of legislation. I certainly do think there are things that need to be done. And then finally, last but by no means least, the nature of disruptive innovation. The healthcare industry, in many ways, may look similar uh, to, to what it's been over the years. Uh, the basic hospital model with doctors and so on, it's been pretty much the same for 100, 150 years. The technology is different, the equipment is different, but the model is similar. And that's open to so very major change and significant change. So for all these reasons, I'm optimistic. But again, talking to you as somebody who came from another country, uh, I have to remind everybody in the audience that this is America. Uh, we're Americans. And so we have to remember that um, we have to remember one important thing about, um, about American Americans. And I think it's summed up very well uh, by, a, by a great statesman. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And, 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 and Bell guaranteed me that there were going to be no hard questions, so I'm fine. I'm going to sit down for a moment if you don't mind. I tried to get Stuart really tired on a hike this morning <laughs> so that uh, he uh, would uh, be very uh, much of a pussycat here for the questions. <laughs> uh, but no, seriously, uh, Stuart, that was terrific. Thank you. And I applaud your optimism, and I think you've given us a huge amount to think about. So thank you very much. Now, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to start the uh, questioning here while we're doing a little collecting of questions from all of you. And if you haven't gotten your questions in, please do right away. Uh, I think a lot of people, despite uh, the sort of long-term optimism that you've expressed and the way in which you think we can move forward, are still wondering, well, what's going to happen in the next couple of years? Yep. And they're particularly wondering about the Affordable Care Act. And we read sometimes that uh, our current president is trying to undermine the Affordable Care Act, having failed to uh, repeal and replace, uh, to go at it in a little more um, indirect way. Mm -hmm. And there are various uh, things that have happened recently that give people some concerns along those lines. Could you just talk a little bit about uh, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about the future of the Affordable Care Act as it exists right now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, first of all, you're, you're raising that concern is very, very valid. Uh, there are a number of I think, court cases and other things, uh, direction to uh, uh, to administration staff in nature in the Health and Human Services Department not to do certain things through the minimum. Uh, court cases, the, the elimination of the mandate 
whilst I have mixed views about the mandate, um, uh, was certainly an attempt to do that. There are certainly people, and on the conservative side of the spectrum, who believe that if you can't win the argument at the, the ballot box, and you can't win the argument in the legislature, then you should try to wreck the programs. I totally disagree with that uh, view. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm a conservative feel that the right way, if you are a conservative and, and want to see the Affordable Care Act change, is to use the very legislation itself to begin to move in a different direction. I, I argued for that before Trump was elected. Um, but you're quite right that there are, there are enormous dangers. I think, and it depends on what specific danger is valid, becomes valid over time. I think we're at the stage in the rollout and the implementation of the Affordable Care Act that it will broadly withstand those kinds of attacks. That's my belief. Uh, a number of states are using either their flexibility um, or just developing new um, uh, steps to try to compensate for things like the, ma the mandate elimination. Uh, I think steps like that are, are happening. And I think, but it is, it is a judgment call, that this particular program is at the stage where it, it can be sustaining sufficiently for the future. But as I said, at the same time that this is happening from the administration, there are lots of other people, Republicans and Democrats, people around the states, different think tanks and so on, are all trying to work with this existing system and so on. So I'm relatively optimistic that the next two years, uh, or two or three years, as I said, I'm, I'm a historian, I think in decades, right? So uh, I, I do think over the longer term, as I tried to say, that we should be optimistic about our ability to find common ground and to work in this area. Okay, we've got several questions from the audience here, and not surprisingly, they want to know what you see as the advantages and the disadvantages of going towards a single-payer type plan? Well, I lived under a, a, a single-payer system for the first 30 years of my life. Um, we never, my parent, I was, when I was brought up, we never had to worry about the cost of health care. What we had to worry about was the availability of health care. Uh, I think there are certain myths associated with the idea of a single-payer system. And, and let me just, just draw a distinction here. If by single-payer you mean you have a system where basically all the money going into that system comes through taxes or some direct payment, and Medicare in a way is like that, that's one approach. And I think within that there can be conservative structures and, and so on. You can have a single form of funding. The issue is do you organize the whole delivery of, of health care in a single way, I think that would be a disaster. Uh, I think we do not know what the right way is to organize health care in this country. We think we do, we try things, and so on. That's why I support the idea of having variation. Uh, I don't think the government uh, 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 employing all the people in the, in the health care system is a really wise thing to do. Uh, if you want to have a healthcare system which every, every part of it is going to be dependent upon what the budget of the federal government is or the states, and you're going to be dependent on that, you're very welcome. But I think it would turn out a lot differently than you think. Okay, we have a bunch of questions about drug prices. Okay. And more, we need more for <laughs> uh, A bunch of questions about drug right. prices and uh, pharmaceutical companies and what's happening to the cost of drugs and uh, do you have some thoughts about how to deal with that? It's a complicated issue uh, because what do we want? We want, to have a, we want to have a society where when we get ill, uh, when we suffer or our family suffers from certain medical conditions, we want a drug industry to figure this out and to provide us with an inexpensive drug that solves the problem. To be able to do that, we have to have a lot of investment in the creation of new, dr new drugs. So generally, there is this challenge, this tension between investment and the cost, the ability to recoup uh, the investments in the drug area. Uh, we also have another issue in this country, as you, I think most of us know, that other countries purchase drugs made by US companies, drug companies, at a lower price than we pay. As an economist, I look at this and I say, oh, this is what we call differential pricing. Uh, this is like airlines. You know, not, you go onto an airline, get, get uh, 
onto a plane, everybody's paying a different amount. So what do you do? Do you, make, do you force everybody to come up to the same level? What do you do? I do think that we clearly are, are paying more. I think the idea that if we simply allowed complete reimportation of drugs, which a lot of people do from Canada and elsewhere, you actually would not make, at least the evidence I've seen, would not make a huge difference in that area. I do think, and I agree, that there are some people, and we as a society should and do, I think, believe this, that have a certain medical condition. We, if we feel that those people should have affordable access to adequate health care, it does mean making sure they can afford the drugs that they need. And I do think that that does require a, an expenditure and a, and a negotiation with the drug companies. This administration, like other administrations, particularly Republican administrations, has really resisted the idea of negotiation between drug companies and the government over the pricing of the system. There are good arguments to resist that, because once the government gets into the business of setting prices, all kinds of issues can occur. But I think to some extent we need more of that than we currently have. Okay, that segues into what is probably a very big question here and goes back to the emphasis you placed on if we can agree on goals, mm -hmm. then maybe we can find our way to uh, think about how we get there. Uh, so the question is, can a conservative support the proposition that in a nation with a um, $17 trillion economy, no one should be denied health care independent of their ability to pay. Yes. What's the next question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and and, and as, I, as I certainly alluded to, when we started off, as I said at the very beginning of the talk, and getting very liberal, very conservative people together, that was one of the first things we all agreed on. In this country, given our wealth, given our values, that everybody should be able to have affordable access to adequate health care. Again, as I, as I did also say, you know, as I said, not, not just as a conservative, I think anybody, I mean, there's a debate about what is adequate, what is affordable compared with spending on education or spending on other things. So we do have to debate that. And I think as a society, that is a, and every other country does that. The UK debates in its free national health service, how much should we spend on the healthcare compared with other things? So the idea that, that the commitment to affordable access and so on means unlimited budgets and, and take money from everything else, I don't think that follows at all. Uh, so as a conservative, I, I definitely don't agree that healthcare should absorb every dollar. But I do agree that we are a rich, civilized society, and that means we should and do and must make a commitment to adequate care for everybody. So that leads into still another question that several people have raised, which is uh, one of the reasons we have a high cost system is because we don't do the things we should be doing. We engage in high risk activities, we eat the wrong foods, we don't exercise enough, you know, the list goes on. Uh, and uh, we've got some thoughts about whether we need to be more paternalistic in those areas, or is it just a matter of educating people better? Yeah. Or should we you know, have the, fi the financial system right. vary in some way with yep. people's behavior, et cetera? It, absolutely. Uh, it's a corollary, in a sense, to what I was saying about uh, there's more to health than medical care, saying we do know there's all these factors. Well, if there are all these factors, shouldn't we be encouraging people? You know, if everybody came to Colorado and went hiking and bicycling, we wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> but too many people in New York, right? Um, so anyway. Um, so yes, I mean, I, I, think, I think it is, and, and it's not unique to healthcare, it's also, un, it's also a factor in other things that we make decisions about. That if we as a society say, we the society shall make a commitment to your ability to get adequate healthcare, there's a, there's a reverse commitment. We expect you, if we're gonna make that commitment to you, to make a commitment to the rest of society. That doesn't necessarily mean you've all got to live the same time of life. Um, it doesn't mean that you, you know, must change to red wine if you like white wine because it's healthier for you. It doesn't mean that, but it does mean, as you said, Bell, that there's a certain amount of nudging and incentives that we've got to look at. And again, in all these debates, there's lines, aren't there? I mean, how much should you push somebody 
to take the steps they needed to be healthy and to protect their lives. The debate over work requirements and, and, and so on is related to that, saying, well, we want to force people to get back into the workforce, not to take things unnecessarily, and so on. It, it, it's a difficult issue. We know that in healthcare there are propensities. People are, some people are more likely, have a greater propensity to engage in certain kinds, to be you know, more overweight. Some people are more overweight because they eat too much. Some people are predisposed. Should you financially penalize somebody who's predisposed, uh, predisposed to an illness? Maybe if they can do something about it, we should. And we do that, of course, to some degree. We do it in lots of other areas. So I think it, it's, it's part of the ongoing conversation that we should be having, that it's a two-way street. We had the same debate in welfare. Welfare was not considered a, a one-way street. It wasn't just that if you were poor, you got help. There was something expected in return. Take steps to become more independent. I think, I think we should discuss that in healthcare, but it's a very complicated issue. I think it'd be useful if you have any thoughts or comments on what some of the states are doing now. Um, I think many of us who live here in Colorado have been um, impressed with some of the experimentation that's been going on here. Mm -hmm. And I know our former director of healthcare, who's a well-known resident of Steamboat right. and who's here, Sue Birch, where are you? Um, is uh, made, made, tried to make a lot of innovations here in the state. Uh, so any, any thoughts on states that have stuck out in your mind as good Yeah, I mean, I think stuff? Colorado is a, uh, a very important state in that regard, as I, as I, as I mentioned, that one of the things in Colorado is not only this connection between um, health care and non-medical features and assuring there's some connection between that, and they're done in unison, but as you well know, as, I mean, one of the things about Bell that you, you ought to know, that Bell and her colleagues at, at uh, Brookings and the Irving Institute and elsewhere have developed this model called the social genome model, which says, what needs to happen, essentially, in your life for you to do well over time? What does the research say? Things like, don't get pregnant too early, you know? All these sorts of things, which Bell can, can tell you about. But a number of these are medical related, and I know here in Colorado that Sue and others have been trying to put into place, how do we connect healthcare, social services, not just only to healthcare, to, to good med healthcare outcomes, but to a, a good progress through life, through doing well over time. I think, I think that's been really uh, interesting. I think, you know, we've certainly seen uh, other states, Massachusetts was a, as a leader, as you mentioned earlier, in terms of trying to move towards um, universal coverage of, of, of various forms. Other states are experimenting, and appropriately so, I think, with um, things we need to think through about uh, healthcare in this country. So states like uh, Arkansas and others are looking at, and have been looking at, how do you look at Medicaid and other parts of the healthcare system, and really try to, in a sense, to try to make it as seamless as possible um, in, in terms of, of, of variations of that kind. There's a lot going on. I think, uh, what I, I'm really seeing a bubbling up of states. I do see certain patterns, and a lot of those are reflective of, of this administration. As I said, when it's an administration gives a green light to a particular approach, you're gonna see more states doing that. But I think states in general have been um, looking at each other, the National Governors Association routinely and, and bring states together. Uh, states are looking at each other. There's just, it's a bubbling process going on. It's, it's really the core aspect of federalism that we're seeing in play across the country. Uh, I have a question here about end of life uh, mm -hmm. conversations and uh, whether we should be doing as much as we're doing at the end of life and are some of these heroic measures uh, part of the extra costs mm -hmm. that we pay for healthcare in this country. There's a lot of debate over what um, the last six months of life and these costs are as a factor in healthcare. There's, it, it, there's quite a debate over what the numbers are. It's certainly a significant amount. We know as you get older, medical costs in general go up. We know as you get closer to the end of life, uh, one of the snags is we often we don't know when the last six months of your life is gonna be, so it's a bit hard to kind of make a hard decision. Uh, what we do know, and, and you refer to it, heroic medicine is often not heroic because the patient wants it to be heroic. It's heroic because the physician, the whole culture of the physician is not to have life end. They, that's the oath. 
I mean, that's what they're trained to do. And if they don't get signals about what else to do, the default is to do everything you can to save this life. That's what we have to change, and you're absolutely right. It's got to be conversations. Uh, Jamie and, and myself and others have attended these death dinners. Death dinners would sound like a pretty miserable thing. It can actually be good fun, you know, I would recommend them. Um, <laughs> But a death, a death dinner is when you get together with, with friends and you actually just talk about this and their actual you know, procedures and advice about how to do it. And you start just saying things like, well, have you had made clear to everybody what you would like? Have you told your kids? Do they know what you would want? Most people have not had this. So, of course, unfortunately, what happens at the, towards the end of life is often you'll have siblings arguing. That tends to happen. So doing that is really important. Encouraging people to do advanced directives. It's becoming more common, but it should be encouraged. Getting people to state clearly to their own family what they want. That's really important. Uh, to, to have these kinds of steps so that people know. Um, and that, that, the, that the doctors, they're not then in the invidious position of having to go into default. Uh, I think the more we do that, the better. It's going to bring costs down. I don't know about how much. Um, but it's the right thing to do. And it, I think it makes for a much more consciously sort of civilized society and a society that's happier to, to make these decisions. Uh, this question is pretty impossible. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm sure you'll find a way to answer it. Uh, what disruptive <laughs> innovations uh, have worked in the past on a broad basis, and what do you see working in the future? Well, I think if you look across industries, there have been a lot of very significant changes, some of which I mentioned uh, earlier on. If you look at what's happening in higher education, I think you're seeing, it's almost like a slow moving, but a dramatic change. The online um, education, the fact now that you can work for Walmart or for Starbucks and get a free education. That's because of those kinds of innovations. Really quite dramatic. It, you tend to get disruptive innovation in those kinds of industries that haven't changed much for multiple reasons. Sometimes regulations and taxes are due to that. So I do think that healthcare is really ripe for this. Um, as I said when I was speaking, the model of healthcare hasn't really changed that much. Uh, it is big institutions with kind of networks kind of associated with them. Um, it's big, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals and so forth. I mean, uh, the big institutions of that kind. That really hasn't changed a lot. It is absolutely wide open to dramatic change. Um, and I think we will see it. We've seen it, at, you know, we have seen it in other industries. Think about the taxi cab business, right? Who would ever go into the taxi cab business? Talk about a, a radical change. In, in an industry. That's, I think, what is going to happen. Now, if I knew what it would happen, first of all, I wouldn't tell any of you. Uh, I would go and make suitable investments. When I did that, I'd probably come and tell you, because uh, I want you to bid up the cost. That, 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 that. But I actually don't know. I just suspect it's going to happen, and it's going to be probably quite dramatic and relatively sudden. Well, we will forgive you for not being Steve Jobs. <laughs> and uh, I'm looking at this wonderful Churchill quote <laughs> and thinking, I hope we don't try 100,000 a, a things right. before we get it right. But I think with your help, we can get it right a little faster. So thank you very, thank you. very much. <laughs>